Next, I would like to introduce Bart Pouchot uh, from the University of Maryland and Tallinn. <coughs> and Bart's going to talk to us about the environmental effects on art, something like that. Yes. Bart? Yes. Uh, first of all, um, I'd like to extend my thanks to the organizing committee um, for organizing this conference. Uh, a lot of this material is um, very new, so uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to your to your commentary. Also, uh, if Rudolf Spadlet painted lots of strange stones, I think we're going to have a lot of that in uh, the next uh, 20 minutes. Around 1900, Henrik Tiedermann photographed himself in front of three colossal erratic boulders. Interlocked grids of brilliant multicolored cellular structures animate the soaring granite cliffs of Skonar Mackey's landscapes. Anthropomorphic figures stand petrified against the silver glow of the moonlight in a work by Emilia Grosita. Baltic Germans ride in a carriage alongside deep depressions of the land in Arlatskivi, where the mythological giant Kalaviboy slept. And dazzling limestone cliffs illuminate Gerhard Rosen's visions of the Baltic coast at the Latvian National Museum of Art here in Riga, you can see upstairs. <coughs> in fact, almost any Baltic seaside landscape is incomplete without the inclusion of protruding round rocks. So why is so much stone and earth? Ulrike Plot has argued that investigating the history of something as simple as an apple tree can provide incredible insight into the colonial dimensions of Baltic history, transcending national divisions of ethnicity or language. Indeed, this environmental turn in Baltic studies, the so-called greening of Baltic history, has produced compelling new ways to approach the region. Simultaneously, many art historians have become interested in the Anthropocene, a period inaugurated by decisive human impact on the Earth's geology and ecosystems. In doing so, art historians yeah, have begun to question preconceived ideas of the representation of land as merely emblematic of nature as nation turning instead towards critical issues of conservation and animal rights in the visual arts. Within Baltic art history, scholars have striven towards creating ever more inclusive narratives, transcending nationalist and ethnocentric histories in order to be more reflective of the region's actual multi-ethnic population. Part of this important shift not only recuperates once marginalized artists but also reveals the essentializing notions of national frameworks. This latter approach has been especially enlightening for artists, especially, I think, landscape painters who decisively rejected the national question. Wilhelm Spurwitz is most notoriously. Taking cue from environmental historians, art historical investigations of the Anthropocene and this multi-ethnic turn that's happened in Baltic history. Today I want to examine, somewhat loosely, the materialities of stone and earth in Baltic visual culture in the decades around 1900. I want to explore how artists visually manipulated stone to convey notions of permanence, indigeneity, mythology, and history. And I argue, I think, well, I, I know what I argue. I argue that thinking through an eco-critical lens offers a way to transcend not only uh, hierarchies of nationality, but also, to a latter extent, uh, hierarchies of medium, revealing a new urgency regarding nature, land, and landscapes in a Baltic context. Thank you. Uh, but what is eco-critical art history, anyways? Uh, as an academic subset, eco-criticism emerged in primarily in the early 1990s, when academics began to integrate more thoroughly ecological and environmental history into their cultural analyses. By 1999, one scholar had even discerned a so-called eco-critical insurgency. 
American art historian Alan Braddock has briefly de de defined ecocriticism as a methodological tool which emphasizes ecological interconnectedness, sustainability, and environmental justice in cultural interpretation. Braddock also suggests that the impetus for ecocritical approaches has been twofold. First, it develops from the concern about present ecological crises, and as in doing so, attempts to make scholarly work more relevant to issues of our day. Within art history, it is common to treat environmental issues and artwork produced, especially after the 1960s, since it emerged concurrently with modern environmentalism. However, environmental issues in art before 1960 are relatively few and far between. And so today, I would like to propose three different ways in which eco-critical approaches uh, can offer new insights into Baltic art. And the reason that I'm focusing um, on these decades around 1900 is because uh, that is what I, I work on. But I think a lot of these ideas um, can be applied both earlier and also later uh, in, in a Baltic context. First and foremost, I think there must be a deeper engagement with the history of science in the Baltic region. In the second half of the 19th century, scientists and scholars in the Russian Empire began to express grave concern about irreversible changes in the Baltic countryside. This concern had developed specifically from radically new developments in science. And one of the greatest curiosities for scientists in the early 19th century was the amount of massive stones found scattered throughout the world. What was especially complex was that such stones were often located in fields far removed from any mountains, and it was this mystery of location that lured the attention of geologists and other scientists to the region. Art historians have focused on this kind of scientific debate, especially in relation to American painting, and I guess as an American, I know this well. Uh, especially the American landscape painter Frederick Edwin Church and his 1861 canvas, The Icebergs. Already in 1989, uh, American art historian Timothy Mitchell revealed that Church's uh, painting was not merely emblematic of Arctic exploration or as an allegory of the American Civil War. Instead, he focuses on a key detail of his painting, namely the strange, kind of almost ugly brown rock awkwardly teetering on the edge of this iceberg noting how it is actually this ugly rock is emblematic of the most revolutionary geological theory of the 19th century, the possibility of a past ice age. Swiss scientist Louis Agassiz's notion that a, uh, of a past ice age was compelling, uh, a compelling theory, rather, to explain the existence of such large stones scattered across various parts of the world. This theory was radical in the 19th century because there was no scientific evidence to prove the beginning of an ice age, or at least what could have caused such a dramatic and uh, long drop in temperature. Agassi's idea of an ice age was especially interesting for scientists in the Russian Empire because its Baltic borderlands, especially in the northern half of present-day Estonia, had, uh, had and maintains the highest percentage of such erratic boulders in all of Europe. The prevalence of these colossal stones was so intriguing for 19th century Baltic scientists that the first, very first conservation efforts in the Russian Empire focused on rocks and not, as one might expect, on plants, forests, animals, or other kinds of ecosystems. The first scholar to conduct a systematic scientific study of these boulders in the Russian Empire was the Baltic German geologist Gregor von Helmersen. His surveys of so-called natural monuments in 1869 and later 1882 were initially an empirical way to demonstrate the importance of these stones and record them within the landscape. This is especially important, what is especially important about uh, his book for our purposes is the fact that Helmerson had illustrated both volumes of his Boulder surveys. American environmental historian Robert Schmur, who has actually written about Estonia, I suggested that these drawings were certainly scientifically accurate, but this common inclusion that we see of a dapperly dressed man with a top hat and flowing pants and cane transforms these drawings beyond the realm of mere scientific illustration. Of course, the inclusion of a human figure against such stones is deployed in order to emphasize the colossal, overwhelming size of these holders. But Halverson's deliberate use of these figures 
whether they're dwarfed in the shadow of a towering stone, curiously gazing at its soaring height, or in the middle, precariously perched atop a pointy peak, emphasize a typical mid-19th century notion of sublime nature and humankind's subdued role within it. It was important for Helmerson and for these illustrations to inspire awe and wonder among his readers because it would be easier to convince them that such rocks were of scientific and cultural value, thereby reducing the possibility of their destruction. One of the reasons that Hedmerson was such an advocate about protecting these boulders was also because of the rapid industrialization occurring across the Russian Empire, especially in the 1860s and 1870s. Hedmerson was specifically afraid of the impact of railroads, which environmentally devastated the forests, fields, and especially the big, ugly, bulky stones that blocked construction paths. Bernard Borchert's small pencil flight of the centaurs, which is made about 40 or 50 years later, even now, however, is related to this fear. Here, a group of Brooklyn-inspired dappled centaurs flee for their lives across a lush green field in, the, uh, in fear of the roaring train speeding straight for them. While Borger does not depict the rocks explicitly, he does depict the fear of losing indigenous mythology connected with the land, a notion which was and remains deeply connected with the boulders dotting the Baltic landscape, a theme to which I will return later. Unsurprisingly, the impact of Helmerson's research and his conservationist call to arms reached far beyond the primarily Baltic German naturalist societies. Karl Robert Jakobson's School Reader, one of the most important Estonian language publications in the 19th century, contained vital information about the natural world for an Estonian audience. Jakobson's third volume, which was published in 1876, began with an introductory text entitled The Life Within Stones. And although he reassured his readers that, quote, of course stones do not eat, unquote, Jakobson continued to imbue rocks and stones with animate traits especially emphasizing that these colossal rocks had once traveled in order to end up in the flat, rolling hills and fields of the northern Baltic. Jakobson's inclusion of such stories as a basis for Estonians to understand the natural world around them, and especially as we see here on the right, these images of large brown rocks on these floating ice flows, <coughs> Uh, demonstrates his, in a, his support of the latest and most radical scientific theories and their normalization for an Estonian audience. Even in 1900, when Estonian scientist Rikard Avi published the booklet The History of Our Earth, he also normalized another dimension of Jakobson's science, referring to these boulders as stones of color, a deliberate connection to Estonian mythology codified during the rise of nationalism in the 1850s and 60s. Thus, even in Avik's otherwise didactic and scientific text, his geological connection to local phenomenon in the Estonian-speaking areas, here specifically boulders along the shore of Lake Pepsi, reveals a deliberately interwoven connection between native myth and natural science, which leads me to my second proposal. An investigation of stones, specifically, and ecocritical and environmental approaches more generally, reveals common and or competing constructions of place and identity. It was not only Estonian educators and scientists who connected these boulders with indigenous mythology. Around the same time, Hedmerson was actively urging stone conservation among the Baltic German elite. Artists such as Georg Friedrich Schlatter captured these very same monumental boulders on canvas. Schlatter's paintings are in the collection at the moment at the Estonian History Museum in Tallinn, which was the premier site of museum exhibitions and display in Tallinn throughout the 19th century. Thus, it is logical, I think, to conclude that Schlatter's paintings were presented actually with other geological specimens and not at art exhibitions. What is interesting, I think, about Schlatter's paintings is that even in their didactic function, that their titles, or at the very least, the way the Estonian History Museum titles them today, retain their indigenous mythological connections. Not all of these rocks are merely great granite blocks that we see on the left, but some are also the seats of mythological giant, uh, giants like Kalavikoi, whose body was so colossal that it quite literally shaped specific parts of the landscape of present-day Estonia. In fact, Schlatter even recorded the depressions in the hill near Oletskivi, known as Kalavikoi's bed. 
The fact that Baltic German artists such as Schlatter maintained Estonian dimensions of their shared landscape demonstrates a more fluid interaction between Baltic German, Estonian, and Latvian cultures in the 19th century rather than direct appropriation or rejection. The importance of boulders as a site of placemaking and identity, however, cannot actually be overestimated. Just a few weeks ago, when I was in a bookstore in Tallinn, I was reminded of the power of this connection, again, besides the fact that I've read this paper, uh, when I noticed this book cover. It features, of course, a black and white photograph featuring four dapperly dressed uh, young men sitting with various objects on top of a colossal boulder on the shores of a body of water. Quickly, I learned that this photograph was taken in 1913 by a young Estonian named Edward Messo, who was actually not a professional uh, photographer, but actually a relatively unknown painter uh, who trained out Pallas in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and moreover, uh, the photograph's title, Kalavipoek Slinging Stones on the Shore of Lake Pepsi, again, directly references Estonian geography and mythology. And this is also a trope, moreover, that um, appears quite often, uh, especially in Estonian painting uh, later in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, what I find interesting, I think, about this photograph is its deliberateness and actually the decision that these four young men decided to get dressed in their best clothing, climb on top of a rock, and sit with a bunch of objects they considered to be Estonian, which, if you think about it, is kind of a weird phenomenon. <clears throat> but if these specific colossal boulders were important, rocks, of course, also appeared in Baltic art for another less exciting reason. The literal landscape of the Baltic region is so flat and covered with forests, marshes, and bogs that these rocks are also some of the only distinctive features in the landscape. For this reason, it is not surprising that these dazzling limestone cliffs feature, for example, in the series of lunette paintings by Gerhard Paul von Rosa and Evian Spurvitis here at the Latvian National Museum of Art. And these paintings, as I'm sure many of us probably know, uh, were commissioned for the museum by its architect and first director, Wilhelm Neumann, who conceived the venue as the premier art museum for all three Baltic provinces. Therefore, even the representation of simply stony seashores became connected with the idea of Balticness and a sort of collective Baltic heimat. However, a keener environmental awareness within Baltic art should and must do more than simply reify national or regional narratives. And so for this reason, I would like to end with my third suggestion about the possibilities of eco-critical art history in this Baltic context. Environmental approaches can also offer new ways to understand old materials beyond questions of ethnicity. Images such as Stairdard Wood as clearing the woodlands, I think, is a good example. Scholarship, of course, on Uders has rightly emphasized his style, noting the warm and cool chromatic tones, and his ideological realism of vital and simple folks engaged in hard work. We can talk about the representation of peasants, the poor rural Latvian woman hear her bare feet touching the soft green grass of the earth as she stands with her arms folded as a man, presumably her husband, digs deep into the earth with a long shovel to rip out a tree. But if we read the painting through an environmental lens, then we see the realization of Gregor von Helmersen's fear this man is clearing nature simply to cultivate it. The horse standing ominously on the left of the canvas of the brown till earth, waiting for this Latvian farmer to rip out and destroy the stones scattered across the landscape. Suddenly, this man's furrowed brow and intense pressure placed on this uh, shovel become somewhat menacing. No longer a mere hardworking peasant, he becomes an agent actually of environmental destruction. Even as these waves lap at the stony Baltic shore beside him. Of course, much more can be said about this painting and the relationship to peasant agriculture in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, but I would sort of just leave it at the fact that Uden's painting, of course, is obviously about the interaction between people and earth and the deliberate manipulation of the natural world. So to conclude very briefly, I would just like to uh, suggest how environmental lens can also suggest new approaches to artworks whose environmental connections are a little bit more ambiguous. Uh, here, at this very end, I have juxtaposed two landscapes, both fantastical and in their own way, somewhat symbolist and therefore purposefully ambiguous. In Emilia Gruzzi, this fantastic landscape, we see a canvas of dark cobalt and periwinkles 
uh, cedars framing the sides that suggests a sort of connection with death, and also the fact that we have these somewhat, uh, as I talked about in the beginning, anthropomorphic figures that seem to be frozen in time. And there's a, a strange sort of connection between uh, being frozen, being petrified, right, and being turning into stone is this way to sort of uh, stop life, right? Uh, and on the opposite, the opposite side of the spectrum, uh, Conan Maggie's uh, Norwegian landscape with pine, we actually see the opposite. And that these uh, cellular structures of multicolored grids uh, are not only stylistic Art Nouveau flourishes, uh, but actually could be, if we think about in light of uh, textbooks talking about life within stones, and the fact that a lot of these, these uh, is there a, I guess there's one, yeah, here, right, that a lot of, that a lot of these forms represent cells, uh, we can also begin to think about sort of the connections between uh, cell biology and microscopes and this idea of uh, interconnectedness of different uh, elements of, of uh, rocks, of stones, of trees, right, we see this similar cellular form here. Um, yes, yeah, so, anyway, so these are my different Thank you. <laughs>